Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode uh, 265th of Create Podcast. Our today's guest is Mr. Henning Schult. He's an oil painter from Leipzig, Germany. And of course, in the down in the description, you can find the ID to his Instagram account, so you can you know find his content there. And I assume that's the only place you post your stuff, right? Um, for now, I I'm working on a website and portfolio, but the things are quite com- complicated right now. <laughs> Yeah, like, you know, just a website would be okay for a portfolio. I don't think you need art station or anything else, but mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. it's stuff like on that. And how are we doing today, by the way? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. And um, here's the thing. Let's start off with the first, you know, signature question of the podcast where I start off, you know, each <laughs> episode with... Give us a little introduction on how we got into the world of visual arts and design. Basically, tell us your origin story if you know what led you to out of everything else that's out there to mm. I don't know to a, to a to a young German boy <laughs> in his teen years or when when you were much younger. Mm. What led you to be interested in art? You know, out of everything else, like you know. Mm. Um. Well, I think the better question would be to ask what what didn't let me stop doing art, or what didn't stop uh, stop me from doing art. Uh, because I always painted since I can remember um, my childhood. I, I always loved to to draw and to paint and to observe actually and through painting and to communicate through painting um and yeah so that never really was uh, something that i started actually so i i just didn't stop doing it <laughs> and um yeah um i believe nearly every ch- child is is drawing or likes to draw to some extent some more some less and somehow um a lot of these ch- children stop doing that and or like dancing and singing and all those things and not only uh, visual arts um of course and i qu- i find it quite interesting um because what is what is stopping them from from continuing doing this creative things? Um, yeah, and I I had my I would say I, I had my problems in, in my uh, youth, so I stopped doing art for like one or two years in in my high school. And uh, I think one of the m- biggest reasons was uh, that I had um, that I had teachers that didn't like my style and they didn't didn't do a great job. So at, at teaching art, and therefore I lost my motivation. I got um, basically I got punished um, for being creative in. Um, art, uh, so in, in in the subject of art, for example, or music, and then somehow I regained my passion. Um, at the end of the high school, I had a great teacher as well. She was um, um, she was called Frau Engel, uh, which means Miss Angel. <laughs> And she was she was literally an angel, and she told me um, to to use those talent, this talent I have, and to make something out of it. And then she um, motivated me to apply uh, to art school, um, and I yeah I got in at the first try. And that's, that's, I think, the most uh, important part of the whole story because then I somehow wanted to be an artist, really. I just 
couldn't think about anything else or doing anything else because before that I wanted to study physics and be a scientist. Um, I still have um, a big interest in, in science, but uh, I just read about it and I can read what I want. I can um, learn what I want. It's basically my hobby. And, <laughs> and I made uh, my previous hobby, uh, namely painting and doing art, um, into my real calling, you know, into my um, job. And yeah, now I'm, now I'm here. I finished art school two years ago and um, I'm still learning, I would say, but uh, I mean, every artist is learning his whole life, I think. Yes. That's a very interesting story. Like the point you mentioned about you really liked physics, but you still pursued art. That that's a really weird crossroads. That like, because I can I kind of understand and relate with that because at some point when I was a teenager, I was studying biology and I was obsessed with genetics and neuroscience and stuff like that. And more than anything, I was obsessed with getting into neuroscience so I can later find a way to collaborate with with the ophthalmologist and try to find a cure for blindness and i was obsessed with that and at and at some point i guess during my school years i got really depressed about everything and mm -hmm. i dropped that dropped everything but later on i found and the thing that helped me through that depression was art and just mm -hmm. the same passion i had for just video games and then later on art and you know storytelling and stuff like that so what i'm trying to say is is like but it's kind of tricky because we only have one life it's like a mm -hmm. save game in a video game we only have just one save game you can delete and restart again easily you can modify the <laughs> stats or the character you just have this one thing and mm -hmm. I, I always like you know had this philosophical issue like should everyone be selfish and choose what fulfills them or should they I don't know, just go against that and try to do something that, you know, offers the most amount of help to the collective, uh, like, you know, hum humanity. I, I don't know, you get what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, what in what way can we bring the most value to our community, uh, community sorry, and to our... I mean, human existence. Uh, I think if we find something that may be a skill, an art, to be literal, and maybe to find something that feels like a calling, then we... And we don't think too much about it. It's it's basically the state of flow, but all the time we, we can't think about anything else and somehow we just live for for doing this. And um, yeah, maybe you have a nine to five job and all you can think about is what you're going to do after this. Or maybe you have found a way to um, to include your passion into your work life. But I think um, it's very f philosophical, but we can answer this philosophical question um, with a little bit of science, I think, when we say that life itself is like a molecule and you as an individual are the receptor for this whole big molecule named life that you have to um, accept it you have to take it in and if we want to create something good and um, useful for our community community we have to breathe something in to breathe something out you now we, we have to if we want to breathe something out um, that's of value we have to breathe something in, and that's basically the things that we are interested in, the things that inspire us. And inspiration just means like inhaling, um, I think. And it's, um, yeah, it's that what 
is consumed by by the artist or even just the individual um, and turned into something new. So we can be creative and be creating um, through observing life and following our passion, I think. I mean, it doesn't matter what we are interested interested in. Maybe it's plants, maybe it's uh, humans, maybe it's just the the, um, the the material things, maybe, and we can, um, yeah, we can observe this, and we can maybe bring something new into this world that's of meaning and and of value to others. Um, I mean, what's very interesting is that so many artists that I have spoken to don't like um, don't like to let people criticize their art and they don't like criticism in art of art in general because they say art is something you can't criticize you can't um, um, you can compare it or things like that but I think um, that comes from a um, underlying fear so we we just ignore it the, the criticism or something like that or maybe we just want to hear good things or maybe we just want to um, maybe we just want to be reassured that we are on the right path but if we want to make something uh, for our human existence for our um, for our world we are living in for our community then we should rethink um, criticism and maybe we should try to to hear as much criticism as we need to, maybe, as well. We don't have to um, listen to it um, and to react um, in, in favor of the person that is criticizing our projects, but maybe we can... Um, hear them out, and maybe we 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 find a way to comprehend what they are actually saying, and maybe understand um, that our thing that we want to communicate is not uh, not sending through, and or or coming through, um, and not sending the right signals, for example, or uh, evoking the right emotions that we actually want to evoke in other people, maybe. Yep, pretty good points. Like, that's actually like a good justification for like doing your own path, which is, I mean, for anyone, everyone else, I mean, mine included, if you're, because it's not just about interest, like there's this concept called Ikigai in Japanese, I think. Mm-hmm. And it's like an intersection with what you like, you know, what you're actually good at, you know, what serves for fulfillment mm-hmm. and all that. There's four factors. I don't remember all of them. But I think in the end, like, you know, it's not just about interest. It's also, it should be, what can you be a superstar at? By superstar, I mean, I don't actually mean a superstar. I mean, like, be great at, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, sure, I, I could, for example, I could have continued to study biology. I had a lot of interest. But I'm not very talented. I'm not, I don't have like the best of memories. I don't have the best stuff like, you know, analytical brain like that, to be honest. I, I know that because I'm more of a creative person. I'm more mm-hmm. of an emotional, creative person myself. So I know that my talent doesn't lie there. But if I like put my focus on something that I'm actually like, you know, good at, maybe in the end, in the long term, that if I just fulfill my potential, that would be the best thing for all, even if it's just a minuscule, like, you know, little effect that I might have, I don't know, with the stuff I'm going to make, I don't know. But, but you get the point I'm trying to make, right? Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of examples of um, individuals in history that combined all those things that were like the, the classical Renaissance man um or the notion of the Renaissance man, basically, like Leonardo da Vinci, for example, was not only an artist, but also um, he was engineer and or like 
engineering, new, new stuff and uh, tools. And he was a scientist. He was interested in and um in the human body and and all those things and he just did it i mean today we have to find a way to make a living of course but um i mean if there are many things that you are interested in then why not um why not uh fulfill the need to um learn more about them I mean, oftentimes these very different things can um, can reinforce each other. Because, for example, I, I as an artist and also um, as an athlete, I see some similar things bit, or many common things between those professions because on the one hand, you have to be somewhat disciplined to master them. And the discipline you build up in sports, for example, is very likely to be helpful in your artistic um, goals or to reach your art artistic uh, goals. And maybe the, the, mm, the mindset of an artist that really likes to experiment and to um, maybe search for different solutions for um, common problems will be very helpful in your athletic endeavors and or professions. And you can you can also grow uh, just resilience, I think, because um, oftentimes and and I believe the most creative um, per, or most um, most of the people that work in a creative field know this feeling of frustration and uh, unsatisfaction, not, not being satisfied by the, the work we are doing and the self-doubt and all those things. And as an athlete, you, you probably will feel this as well. Uh, so you're kind of competitive um, with your own self, with yourself you were yesterday, for example. You want to be better. You want to know your own limits. And I mean, I think that the, the work we put into one profession will always, nearly always, uh, will benefit um, on the other side, on the, on the other side, uh, the, the other profession. All right. And here's the thing, just another question I had, like, you know, how are people's perception in Germany about, you know, choosing an arts career or, you know, saying that you want to go arts, like, what was your family's reaction? And, you know, society's reaction because that's that's such an interesting you know topic for me because i interview people from like all over the world basically and like i always get different answers to this stuff and i'm just mm. curious you know how was i was like you know that situation for you i mean i would i would say the german culture is kind of traumatized because of the world war one and two and in these, or in the context of of the Second World War, especially, um, art was misused or basically abused by the government and abused by the ideologies um, of the regime of the um, and Nazis. And then you you think of artists that wanted to fight against ideology, this ideology, and maybe they were punished, maybe they didn't have the capacity or resources to fulfill their um, purpose in art. And today we might think, okay, artists, um, artists are just people that did, can't do anything else. <laughs> 
<laughs> and therefore they are they, they're becoming artists or maybe they are becoming po politicians <laughs> you know it doesn't matter uh, but uh, I think that art has um, a power um, and it's I believe in the power of art that brings people together uh, we need to um, to be more open, I think, in, in the society, especially in Germany, so we can form a new common identity. You know, Germany was split a uh, long, long time into two different political ideologies. So the 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 East and West Germany conflicts um, are not so long ago. Um, actually, so we can learn from that because um, all those hostilities that had grown over the years are still there. They're, they're still not gone. So I would say Germany is still kind of split up and very un, not very not uh, very much not united um, and I think artists play a big role uh, in reuniting um, the Germany but um, for example um, I had luck uh, with my parents actually so my parents uh, are so um, so into to my art they they love what I do. Uh, and they were my my biggest fans from and, and critics actually my biggest fans and critics I've ever had. Um, yeah, be, because um, my father always wanted to be an artist too, somewhat, but he didn't have the resources. He had to get a job quite early in life, um, move out from home um, at sixteen, and so on, and uh, to to stand. Um, on his own legs and it was quite rough at that time to to do that without um, the help of the parents and now I I can say I had the help of my parents to fulfill my um, um, my calling uh, as I would say and therefore I'm very very thankful because I, I know that not everybody has the opportunity like like I did, and so I kind of feel that I maybe, maybe it's fate. I don't know. It's <laughs> it's kind of um, crazy when I think about it because um, because I I sometimes forget how lucky I am maybe, to do that, actually. All right. I can understand what, you're, what you mean. Yeah. And, like, aside from that, like, I, I'm, I'm kind of, like, you know, really intrigued, you know, because I, I assume when you were, like, you know, younger, you used to play video games, right? Or you were never into those stuff. <laughs> Um, I played video games a lot as I was like 16 to 18 years old. <laughs> I, I lost lots of time um, playing video games. Yeah. And the reason I'm asking that is because usually for a lot of artists, like in the industry or digital artists, they, they of course, their big inspirations are either, you know, any form of entertainment that they really love, like movies. Mm. Um, games mostly, like you know, and animation, whatever you know. And I thought, you know, maybe if you if you used to play video games or were into that stuff, you know. But uh, that's you know kind of interesting to me that you took a completely different path than most people mm. when it comes to art. Like because the story of you know people who get into traditional art is sometimes a little bit different. Like maybe from the beginning they had an influence from someone. Mm. Or they got you know encouraged when they were younger through their paintings or drawings when they were by their instructors or something. But that's mm. kind of interesting. Mm. That have you ever thought about it, like you know doing digital or just going to you know 
in in the like direction of entertainment industry at some point you know before all of this so i tried uh, digital art but um i i'm just not fitting right there i, I think because or it doesn't fit for me because um i need the material somehow i like to work with the material on on a big canvas for example um so i probably will not be doing digital art in near future <laughs> i i couldn't uh, see myself there but uh i have lots of respect for it because it's basically world building oftentimes uh, especially when you're a designer for video games or for um, for movies and, and stuff like that or even um, animation and um, comics or stuff like that but I personally think that my strength is lying within the big oil painting or maybe some big drawing um, that I can work on and maybe I, I need I need maybe I need this uh, bodily work um, when it comes to art I, I don't know why but I think that art is very emotional for me it's more about emotion than about pure storytelling and emotion just simply means inner, inner movement and I think that we can't um, can't uh, no I, I need to translate <laughs> no worries no worries take your time like actually yeah. like, you know, I really appreciate that oh sorry go on uh, I got, no, no, I have it. Um, so I think we can't separate the inner emo emotion, the inner movement from the outer movement. And I'm, I mean, everybody who dances knows that. Or when we when we get agitated, or maybe we we feel an upcoming emotion then we also feel the movement of the heart. We can feel the movement of our breathing. And um, this will impact, of course, our uh, pure and general movement um, as well. So I think when I do art, I, when I'm doing art, I need to feel the art so I can move in a certain way uh, that the art is present um, as I want to have it. Uh, and maybe that works, maybe, maybe that doesn't work, but um, yeah, I think that's the reason why I like to paint on big canvases. Yeah, you need a medium that's tactile. I get that. Mm. Like something that you can feel. Yeah. And by the way, what I was saying, like in the middle while we were translating, I was going to say, like, I really appreciate that you still said yes to the podcast, even though you're, you weren't, you know, feeling super ready in your English. Because one of the most common reasons people, like, you know, say when I invite them for the podcast, they say, like, you know, uh, they, they won't come. They say, oh, my English is not ready. I'm not confident. Give me a couple of months. Give me a year. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is I actually follow up with that. And I sometimes message back after a year or something, mm -hmm. actually. So, hey, how's, how's the schedule? Is How's things going for the podcast? I'm like, oh, no, sorry. I don't think I'm, I'm ready for this. And, and it's all because of English. But even though their English is like, you know, sure, it's not perfect, but it, it's communication level. Mm -hmm. Like they're too afraid to challenge themselves to get better. But And the thing is, you know, I'm, I'm an English teacher, by the way, as well as a, as a side thing. Oh. And one of the most, uh, like, you know, sim like, annoying things I see in students is that they, like, and it's just in every language, by the way, I, I think so. And I, and I don't think it's necessarily like a language thing. It's more like a s social anxiety thing. People don't understand that for speaking, you, for you to improve in it, you need to speak. That's how you practice the speaking. 
it's not yeah. like writing, reading, or listening that you can, you know, practice them on your own with with a YouTube video or something. Mm. With the speaking, you can't just, you know, speak with yourself in a mirror. You actually have to force yourself to speak. Sure, you're gonna you're gonna be wrong. Your accent is gonna be off. Like all of that is true, but you gotta do it until it gets better. I'm sorry for anyone who thinks you know they can just you know move around it, move around mm. it or something, or take a shortcut. But it's not. And I really appreciate that you still, you know, said yes. By the way, your accent, everything is correct. You know, don't worry about that if I'm being honest. Um, <laughs> but but a lot of people is still, for example, even if your level of English, they would still say no. They say, oh, I'm not confident. My English is not perfect or something. Oh, mm. it's, I think it's mostly social anxiety thing. Like if you're someone who um, really don't have that or you're good with that. Like, for example, I started learning Turkish like three years ago. Like, you know, and every, every one of my classmates had that social anxiety. But I, since I already learned the, like a language that's like you no know, non native to me, I knew that all right, I need to force myself, and I was just you know saying the most like disgusting sentences in terms of grammar. <laughs> <laughs> and my teacher would still encourage it because he actually knew that yes, he actually people need to speak for their speaking to get better, you know. Mm-hmm. Just like yeah. even right now, like a couple of days ago, I started Dutch on Duolingo. Because I because I might move to Netherlands in a couple of months, and I I'm just using every single word I'm learning, and I'm trying to use it in sentences. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that that's the key for anyone who's listening. Just speak. Just take a notepad and r- any word you write, no, like write them down. Any grammar point you you learn, write them down and try to use them as soon as possible, especially with the native, preferably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I Sorry, think, I went on a rant. Come on. Uh, I think it's a good point because. You, if you want to learn swimming, for example, you can do those exercises on the ground, or you can dry swim, so to, so to speak, as long as you want. But you have to get in the water. You have to get in the water at some point and uh, tr- try to swim. And so, yeah, I I think the most people that are criticizing. The, the German English are Germans. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't know because every time I talk with other uh, people uh, in English, they say, "Oh, it's okay. I understand what you're saying." And when I talk with Germans, they are like correcting me, and they they say like, "Oh no, this is not good English. You have to pronounce it like that." And I I just don't know. It's just the Germans. <laughs> I think it's the German mentality, like to be as correct as possible. But um, I don't know. The the world is still spinning around. You know, the, the Earth is spinning, and years are passing, and we are not getting younger. So I I try to use my time and to be as maybe brave in in this case. Maybe I'm I'm, I'm brave, but I, I I like to be this. Uh, as much as possible. So yeah, thank you um, for letting me know that my English is understandable. <laughs> um, no, it's that, good. Like I, I didn't good. mean that as like an insult or something. Like by saying understandable, like yeah, it's good enough. No, like it's it's actually good. Okay. Like I don't know what else to say. Like don't worry. <laughs> like but the thing is, you know, um, like one problem I see with people, they try to force on fake accents, which never will get you any good results but you're not faking accent you're, it's your actual accent that's been developed and you only get that by actually as I said before speaking shocker yeah. I know like you know because uh, there's actual uh, actually a lot of like you know in Iran especially like I'm actually Iranian um, there are a lot of like you know English teachers who just to look cool you know they force accents like these weird British accents nah. just to appeal to the, the students but because they want to, because even as teachers and professors, they haven't spoken English in their life that much with the native or something. So they have to, you know, like, you know, save, you know, face for some reason, you know, by having this fake British accent, I guess. But that strong accent develops on your own. Like, you know, your accent is a unique thing, your way of speaking, like in any language. So just don't fake it. <laughs> don't think, you know, if it sounds weird, that's fine. It'll get better, you know, because because people can feel that, you know, in the beginning when you start language, your accent, of course, your way of speaking is going to be a little bit off, but that gets fixed by time, you know? Yeah, right. I mean, 
sometimes I get messages on Instagram and or other people asking me like how can I be better at drawing how can I learn how to, to draw like you or like somebody else and I just say I mean the obvious thing you, you have to draw you know uh, you have to get out and uh, always always take a book with you 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 need to be drawing all the time if you want to be good at drawing and yeah I, I, I think there's no secret you know there's just no secret in learning the things we, we want to learn especially when it comes to um, skills not information but for um, skills uh, like speaking or uh, reading and maybe even playing a, a instru an instrument for example you have to do it you have to practice it uh, you have to be um, willing to to suck at at it yeah you have to be willing to be terrible at the thing you do at the beginning and then you can say well now it's um now it's time to to be better and tomorrow you probably going to be a bit better than yesterday yeah so um actually yesterday i had um a podcast recording too and what it was much more a broken a much more broken english for me um and now i'm a bit more fluent than yesterday so i i already can feel the learning <laughs> so i got the advantage nice nice you got the warm-up nice um so here's the next question which i was could be kind of interesting how does your process work like when you want to start working on a new piece or a project like what does the structure of your pipeline usually look like you know for you um, mm, so i noticed that i do some sketches um right away when i have an idea so that's I think that's a good thing to do um, when you have an idea to take a note or to uh, make a small sketch. And uh, most of the people or artists I know are like in love with uh, with uh, with their sketches and with their ideas. And that's something I would not recommend because uh, I usually um, I usually take a step back and let it rest so for example i had this painting right here and the first sketch i made for this painting was two or maybe two and a half years ago before i started painting it and now i'm now i'm painting it and i think okay maybe maybe i should do something different and therefore i resketch um the 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 theme again and again uh, till I'm satisfied somehow and sometimes I do lots of sketches or uh, sometimes I take several attempts it takes several attempts uh, till I'm satisfied so uh, some paintings are like painted five times and I just didn't like it and then I Overpainted it and just started from from uh, all over again from the start. And yeah, I think that's the 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 way I I find my my pieces and my solutions for my ideas because you know I could start on a white canvas and I could be satisfied, but that's not the way. For me, I I sometimes do it um, as yeah um, just just to make sure that I'm on the right path. You know, <laughs> I I get myself out of the comfort zone and then I start just painting without any um, idea or uh, work before. And 
yet it usually doesn't go well. So I I know I'm on the right path doing my two or three years of pre preparation for a painting. But um, yeah, that's just how it is, I think, for now. And uh, one thing that comes up uh, or uh, comes to my mind is uh, that we we often think we have so much to to incorporate or to include uh, excuse me to include in to our work so we are overwhelmed by ideas and we can select them and then we might struggle or doubt uh, or are doubting um, our process because we can't fit all our ideas into one single piece and that's just um, a thing that everybody that makes art needs to realize that yeah that you can't fit all your ideas into one painting and you need to maybe write down your ideas like 20 ideas you want to do and then you have to pick only one and usually the the one will pop up and you know what you should be focusing on for that time maybe and sometimes you get maybe stuck in in the idea and and in the process and you you reach a plateau uh then you can maybe think of an other aspect or idea or inspiration that you had later and usually that will work as a good cycle so maybe it's one day and you you feel already feel stuck and then you can change the topic in your artwork or sometimes it's two years and then you um, feel the plateau and then you know you should change the topic maybe um, I I know it's not easy to explain because or uh, or to understand because it's um, very abstract but I think some some people might know what I mean yeah and one question that I was, you know, looking forward to ask you is, um, I looked through your content a bit, you know, of course, before we started recording, you know, we, I mentioned that, you know, how I found your, uh, like, you know, page was to my for you page. And, you know, that's, ba that basically means, you know, your page is getting favored by the algorithm gods, you know, right now. And, <laughs> and I was wondering, like, you know, what do you think in your opinion really helps, like, you know, boost the engagement? I think, of course, the one and one main answer I could come up with, and I think this is one of the main reasons, is you you started posting reels. Because I went back to your post and I realized, you know, the reels really helped, which, you know, it's kind of sad because Instagram was supposed to be a photo sharing app, but everything is turning into TikTok right now. Instagram, <laughs> YouTube, YouTube with YouTube shorts. Mm -hmm. um, because I guess that's what gets the most engagement out of people. That's it. But, but, I, but aside from reels... Um, are there anything else that you think really helped, you know, boost your socials? Because a lot of artists might be listening to this podcast and everyone, you know, wants, wants to, you know, make their own brand and everything. Because that's the important mm -hmm. thing in this today's world. I don't know if you follow the news. There has been, there have been massive layoffs lately in the industry all over the world. And a lot of people are losing their job. And more and more people realize that, wait, I prob it's a good idea to probably have my own stuff going on aside from just being a cog in the machine of a company or something, you know? Yeah, of course. So, um, I prayed to the algorithm gods and it worked. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> please let me blow up, um, on Instagram. No, uh, I noticed that reels, of course, will help because, Mm. you have to count in that the the whole system of social media works because the, the attention span of most people is getting shorter and shorter and you have to underestimate this attention span uh, to, to some extent and maybe to play with that um, 
and and maybe that will will mean that you're cutting your videos uh, more frequently, for example, more frequent cuts and uh, different angles, or maybe it's something else, a, a great hook that just can't be ignored, for example. And yeah, on the other side, I would say it's quality because um, just as I uh, invested some money into a good camera, um, I, I did, I did just do good on, on, on Instagram because I, I think in the field of art and maybe even sports, um, a, a big amount of people or a huge amount of people want to see something aesthetically pleasing and Therefore, you have to, you know, get creative, um, kind of try to make good videos, for example, or good content, high quality content. But um, for some people, that's not necessary because uh, the content itself is a, is good, uh, well, well structured. Maybe it's um, very informative or. Uh, very interesting to some uh, to some people, but yeah, I, I would say the key thing is try to um, underestimate attention span when it comes to videos. <laughs> that some somehow works, or you go into a complete different direction that maybe also works. So you have like no cuts at all, just um, a one take and. That, that just fulfills all the, the I mean the that fulfills all those um, expectations from the viewer yes all right and how have you been dealing with the sudden like you know increase in followers and people just all this attention on you like out of nowhere like mm -hmm. Has there been any, like, just were you already prepared for that? Like, you know, any mental, like, anxiety thing is happening? Like, just, how are you dealing with it? Mm, so I, I once heard of a study that was made uh, in which they took children that like to draw from... Uh, so they did just like drawing and uh, those children um, were asked to, to draw a picture and then to show it to some somebody to I don't know the responsible person whatever and to their caregiver or, or something else and the caregiver uh, then rewarded them with a star or with a you know like um, like um, something manifested on on their paper like a rocket or a bee or a, a star and something like that and all of a the sudden they they did lose interest in painting so they had they didn't have any fun painting anymore um, but they did it uh, so they could get more rewards and manifested rewards. Yes, not not only the word like, okay, you did great or it this looks good, but um, when you see it uh, on your paper, when you can collect it like likes or followers or something like that, which um, um, also is very... Um, trackable for, for our minds and we can we can somehow estimate our self-worth um, or maybe we we not estimate but we um, um, you know we switch it up uh, we we confuse it yes we confuse it um, 
with our actual self worth, and we associate um, the likes or the the recognition or the the comments and all those things um, with our actual self worth. And yeah, so I just tried to keep creating i mean that's my mantra uh, so i have to you know i have to be very cautious because i don't want to um make it for the audience i don't want to make it because so, so of course um, art needs an audience but i personally um want to make art and i want to make it for for art itself and not for the the comments of followers or likes and yeah i see the the dangers of that so um maybe maybe i i will fall into a big abyss sometime and then i just do all the things because i get likes and then i'm totally miserable maybe and my art probably will not look as good but uh, now I'm, I'm on a good way I think so I can be detached from from the reward yeah I think that's something to keep in mind um, especially when you post your art or your your projects on social media that's actually a really healthy mindset about it nice good luck man <laughs> and the next week I want to ask is who are some of your favorite artists and designers that have inspired you the most mm. Mm. so i studied in leipzig in germany and one of my um uh, one of uh, one of uh, the professors uh, or former professors uh, was Neo Rauch and Neo Rauch is a very very um, established artist um, in the figurative art world and contemporary art world and I think um, his paintings are very unique and very very appealing to me um, because they are so rich in detail and on the other hand, I like the work of Ruprecht von Kaufmann. Um, he, he studied in LA and then came back to Germany. And his work is also very, very appealing to me because it's uh, very, very creative and very um, balanced because it has elements of... Um, symbolism and also some abstract elements that are uh, i really appreciate yeah awesome and um here's one thing i also wanted to ask you you know as well what is the main subject of your artworks and what made them interesting to you of course you know on your page people can you know with a brief look you know they can get a sense of you know what the subjects are but i want to hear more from you like you know what is your goal from the subjects you pick basically you know what feelings do you like to convey to the audience mm. so there are several things on my mind um and i I'm, i mean they are always present like i would say for example the um, the martial arts are very interesting to me, uh, especially grappling and wrestling, because the, the, the bodies of the athletes are forming a knot of human, and this knot seeks his own limits. I think that's very interesting. Um, I like to depersonalize the people that I'm painting, um, so, for example, in this painting, you don't see the face. And in other paintings, I try to minimize the character of the person. 
or um, for example, when I'm painting wrestlers, they often don't even show their face or when it's just the side of the face and it doesn't play a big role or maybe maybe it's in a shadow so it's not very um, very much in the focus of the painting because I want to look at the human body um, like I would look at the uh, landscape for example I, I like to study the human body as it was a landscape and Another theme that always is coming up is uh, masks, for example, because um, masks reveal something fundamental about human nature. I think uh, it's it's a universal thing to to make masks and to um, cover oneself up in, in some contexts, and I think that we can learn much about the, the human nature when we look at um, such universal, universal um, emergence, emergencies like, um, like masks, for example. Because uh, when we wear a mask, we, we can cover up something that we don't want to show but also, so we can lie, but also we, we can speak the truth um, by putting on a mask uh, because this mask maybe will show something um, that is not revealed yet uh, by our normal appearance. And another um, one of the most important things uh, in my or aspects that I'm, I love to discuss through my art is um, animals that are extinct. Like, for example, the Tasmanian tiger, um, which was extinct, I believe, in 1936. And kind of indirectly through humans um, colonizing Australia and or the Western civilization colonizing Australia and bringing dogs that were better hunters than the Tasmanian tiger and therefore the Tasmanian tiger didn't have the, the resources to reproduce and to um, to um, survive. Yes, and I, I liked the the story of this um, this animal, for example, because now scientists are trying to uh, they're trying to um, se sequence or like to um, but now I'm searching for a word to the DNA. They are trying to um, recreate the DNA so they can um, so they can let it um, or to, so. Oh, I'm struggling right now. I'm sorry. Let, let me start over again. So the the artists and uh, not, not the artists, the, the scientists are trying to recreate the, the genome um, so they can breed a clone of the last or one of the last um, Tasmanian tigers and then they want a somewhat foreign animal or like or like um, not foreign animal but an, an animal that is not the Tasmanian tiger to give birth to this clone and this is very I mean it's kind of fucked up because somehow the human or humans uh, the humans can't live with their guilt I think and then they want to play God or you can turn it around as well so they want to play God and then they seek out uh, for some um, reassurance and for some moral uh, righteousness to to 
to do that so they can play God. And uh, yeah, that's very interesting to me. My, sometimes uh, this the, the Tasmanian tiger pops up in my um, artworks kind of randomly because um, yeah, because it's just wandering through my paintings. I think it's it's um, always there. Yeah, awesome. And one thing I really noticed and liked about your works, by the way, like this is a com some couple of suggestions. By the way, um, I don't know if you like if I were you, I'm sure. Like, I, like the, I think what? Oh, yeah, just let me collect my thoughts for a second. I'm just rambling on. Wait. What I'm trying to say is that I'm sure there are a lot of, you know, artists out there and athletes out there who, especially athletes, like, you know, BJJ athletes or, you know, just martial artists who would pay good money for your artworks that are, you know, with the subject of like, you know, doing like you did one with the arm bar, I think. Mm -hmm. Like those subjects, I think, you know, most people, a lot of people don't do that. There was this artist I knew before who did used to do oil paintings of different famous shots of wrestling matches. And he was really good, but but his style was a bit different than yours. All right, so I think your style actually fits that better, like different BJJ poses, or maybe take famous photos and use them as reference, but not actually like you know what I mean. Copy the people in them. Mm. I, but I'm, but I know that you don't do this for necessarily money or stuff like that. But if you ever wanted to, you know, try this out, you know, for like a, like a business venture, I think that would be a really good idea if I were you. Because I'm yeah. sure there are a lot of like artists out there who pay good money for art like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. Um, I think it's a good uh, base uh, for my art because it's aesthetic. It's not too complicated because I can understand that when you want to hang up some art in artwork in your living room that you don't want to get depressed <laughs> for example you don't want to think about uh, the purpose of life or maybe you don't just don't want to be looked at by some weird eyes of, of a creepy portrait or something like that and yeah, um, yeah therefore I think that that's, that's the reason why the paintings um about grappling and and wrestling are so uh liked um yeah i i think that's one of the reasons because it's aesthetic and also just interesting and somehow um ordinary, extraordinary maybe because I, I don't really know any other artists doing those kinds of paintings. I know Steve Houston. So Steve Houston is a very great oil painter, but he focuses more on boxing and um, men uh, working and construction working and stuff like that. Um, and this, those are very great paintings, by the way. Uh, yeah, but I I didn't see him doing wrestling or grappling, I think. Especially because uh, wrestling and grappling is... Um, I, I don't know if, I, if, if that's true, but I think it's more common today to start grappling sessions and to go to a, yeah, to, to a grappling club or whatever to... Um, yeah, because it's kind of famous, maybe through MMA and um, maybe Jerome and stuff like that, and Joko Willing, all those guys, those big strong guys, um, all love to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and grappling and say that that it's the best for maybe street fights and stuff like that. And therefore, I think the audience. Um, regarding grappling and wrestling is growing. Yeah, maybe I should... That could be uh, it. Excuse me? No, I said that could be it. Maybe, yeah, you're right. Ah, yeah, yeah, that could be it. So, um, I mean, 
I don't know if that is it really true, but um, I would say I, I perceive it like that. Yeah. All right. And well, we've reached the final question and section of the podcast, which is called Time Capsule. And I know, like, you probably can guess, you know, what it's going to be like. Uh, so I'm just going to phrase the question and situation like this for you. Imagine if you had like uh, only a couple minutes to say whatever you want to anyone else who might be listening to this podcast at any point of time in the future. Now, what, what I would suggest is, could you tell us like till this point in life, what are some of your most valuable and important life lessons you've learned, you know, that you could tell it to anyone else who might be seeing it in any point of time in the future from one human to another human being. So if you want take your time, Think about it well, and go on. Mm. Okay, now, uh, earlier in this, in our conversation, I said that life is a molecule and you, as an individual, are the receptor. Um, what I mean by that is that life gives us challenges and maybe even um, oh now I have to translate a word for a second just um, yeah it's, okay now life gives us um, missions maybe or tasks um, through basically through emotions. And what I'm trying to say is that every time you ask your question, why, it doesn't need to be very specific, but every time you ask why is something like that, you have to ask yourself what for. Not just why, but because now you can for example, say, why, why do I find flowers beautiful? Because we as humans have a sense for beauty, <laughs> somewhat. And then you can ask yourself, what for do I have a sense of beauty? And then you can say, ah, maybe so I can create beautiful things, for example. And you can ask yourself the question before you step in the ring uh, with your training partner, training partner, and you can ask, okay, why do I feel fearful or anxious? Um, yeah, because you can get hurt, for example, in a, in a boxing or wrestling match. But you can ask, okay, what am I fearful for, but well, better, uh, let me say it better. So what for do I feel anxious? So maybe to overcome your fears, maybe to grow um, by overcoming your fears. So there's always a task in your why question, like maybe why is there a problem? Why am I not able to... Uh, to have good and healthy relationships with other people. Yeah, because um, you had terrible, par terrible uh, parents and maybe you are traumatized and you... and so on. The, the answer can be pretty long. It's n maybe not a mystery, but it's uh, pretty clear to, to some extent, I think. And you can, have a, uh, you can say... So what for do I am not able to, uh, to, to have good and healthy relationships? So you can work on yourself and find a way to, to make it possible for you. And yeah, that's, that's quite complicated to explain, I think, because most people need a big purpose in life, I think, just like, oh, I'm alive because I'm an artist, or I'm alive because 
I want to have kids or I'm alive because I want to make money and grow rich and stuff like that. But I think that's so far away to, because you can die any day. First of all, you can, you can die in a few years or maybe a few weeks because some random dude uh, runs you over with, with his car for example, or maybe you get uh, a diagnosis from a doctor and then you, you're ill and you know you have just one year to live or something like that. And now all those things you wanted in your life um, are useless. So you, you can't accomplish them. And so the task is not to... to to focus on a specific outcome in your life. The task is to focus on the here and now and find the task in the here and now. So, for example, um, why am I prone to... For, ex for example, yeah, why am I prone to um, addiction? Yeah, so you can work on that and be better. So what challenge do you want um, from your life? And I think the answer is always right in front of you. And maybe, maybe that's a good way to, to, um, to think about life. And on the other hand, I would say, um, instead of asking, what do you want in, in the future? Ask yourself, what do you want not to be present or to be in your future? So, if you don't want to be alone, you need to uh, you, you need to work on your relationships. If you don't want to be ill, you have to work on your um, health. If you want to be um, fulfilled, because you you found something to, uh, to, to do whatever it is, your, your passion, then you have to find time to work on that. And I think the, the most important question is, what do I want not to happen in the future? And maybe if you formulate uh, or if you, if you writing down for example the the don't i i don't want to have a list <laughs> then maybe um try to use as much words for emotions than possible because in the end it's not about the things around us but, but it's about the emotions that we are seeking i think yeah so i try to um cover up uh, the, 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 my answer as uh, quickly and precise as possible, but I know it's very abstract, but that's, that's, just, how, that's just how it is, I think. Yeah, and honestly, that was one of the most comprehensive answers I've ever gotten to that question. So yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> and well, thank you so much for coming by and taking your time to come on this podcast and thank you to anyone who tuned in and listened to this episode as always if there's any comments suggestions or anything else you know leave them down in the comment section below or you can just shoot me a message on the career podcast you know uh, instagram page and with that being said take care everyone stay safe and until the next episode bye 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 bye